He returned to the World Wrestling Federation during the first week of this year to triumphant praise from fans all across the world. Weeks later, he then challenged for and won the WWF World Heavyweight Championship, but then seemingly disappeared into thin air. However, this week, Hulk Hogan returns to in-ring action. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Tyler Vance Rants. I'm your host, Tyler Vance himself. It is April 14th, 1984. Last week, Ricky Steamboat announced that his retirement from professional wrestling is no more. After failing to capture the NWA World Heavyweight Championship from the Nature Boy Ric Flair, that itch, that championship chase itch, was just too strong for Ricky Steamboat to resist, and so he will be returning to in-ring action on a full-time basis, and also continuing to challenge for the NWA World Heavyweight Championship. Also in the NWA, the NWA television champion Tully Blanchard successfully defended his television championship against Brickhouse Brown, while in the WWF, Rowdy Roddy Piper once again made enemies with a guest on Piper's pit, this time the Polish power Ivan Putski. And also, like I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, Hulk Hogan was announced to be returning to in-ring action this week against Tiger Chung Lee in a non-title match. I'm not sure about you, but I'm quite eager to see Hulk Hogan after such a lengthy absence from television, so we'll be tuning into the WWF's flagship show, Championship Wrestling First this week, and Vince McMahon and Gene Okerlund immediately greet us on commentary. The first match of Championship Wrestling sees Charlie Fulton taking on the WWF Intercontinental Champion Tito Santana in a non-title match. Fulton does seem like he's going to start the match on top, but that is before the Intercontinental Champion hits him with a monkey flip and a Hurricane Rana. From there, Santana is completely on top of his opponent and wins following a flying forearm. Vince McMahon brings us another edition of the WWF Update, and this week's focus is on someone we haven't really heard or seen much of on WWF television, Big John Studd. All McMahon is able to tell us about the big man is that he is $30,000 richer following a recent Battle Royal win in an untelevised event. You know, that's great for Big John Studd, however, I feel like I should be $30,000 richer for this waste of my time. Up next in singles competition, Jose Luis Rivera has an opportunity to even the score with his rival, Greg the Hammer Valentine who's accompanied to the ring by his manager, Captain Lou Albano. It seems that since their last encounter, Rivera has been studying where he went wrong and where the hammer went right in their last match together, as he starts things off very strong. Unfortunately, no amount of studying tapes is equivalent to in-ring experience, and Jose ends up learning another painful lesson. He suffers several power moves from Greg Valentine, and then loses following a falling elbow from the hammer. They do say that it's the third time that's the charm, Rivera. Mike Powers takes on Jimmy Superfly Snuka in one-on-one -on -one competition next, and Powers tries to get a one-up over the Superfly prior to the match beginning, but Snuka remains afloat. As the match gets going proper, it's quite clear to me that Powers would stand absolutely no chance against a regular fly, let alone a super fly. He loses fast to Jimmy Snuka's flash from the top rope, and then actually has to be stretchered out of the ring afterwards. His career might be over, folks. Tag team action is up next as Francisco Vasquez and Johnny Rivera team up to take on clients in their own right of Rowdy Roddy Piper, Dr. D. David Schultz, and Mr. Wonderful, Paul Orndorff. The match itself is a completely one-sided affair. Dr. Schultz and Mr. Wonderful both take turns absolutely devastating their opponents, and they mercifully bring the match to an end following an elbow drop from the second rope from the good doctor onto Vasquez. Piper immediately follows the match up by hosting yet another segment of Piper's Pit, and this week's guest is none other than Frank Williams. 
During the interview, Roddy Piper absolutely tears into Williams, saying that he's actually never seen Frank win a match, and then targets the man's wrestling ability. I have never seen you win a match in my whole career of watching you, but you, you lack the guts, you lack the authority to go in there, maybe a little cowardism, maybe what you do, maybe you should be making pizzas. This spurs an angry response from Frank, but before he can get too verbal, I might be a lousy wrestler, but I'm still in there. I got not a pay or no Here's the thing. When you go to somebody's house, you're a guest there. You should act with dignity, grace, and respect towards your host. If the host or someone else that lives there insults you in their own home, you, as the bigger person, should then excuse yourself. Instead, what Frank Williams does is the complete opposite, because when Roddy Piper pointed out the actual fact that Williams is indeed a loser, he got really defensive about it. You never attack the host in their own home. And if you do, the host has every single right to stand their ground. I applaud Roddy Piper's steadfast action to standing his ground against such unwarranted aggressive behavior from Frank Williams. And then, history is made. They think they got the answers, I changed the question. Johnny Ringo takes on Cobra Corps Commando Sergeant Terry Daniels, who's accompanied by the Cobra Corps Commandant Sergeant Slaughter. For goodness sakes. Sergeant Daniels looks incredibly green when the match gets started, and it begs the question, did the Cobra Corps Commandant actually train this Cobra Corps conscript? Terry manages to secure a very lucky sunset flip pin over his opponent, and as he heads back to the locker room area, to my surprise, he's actually chewed out by Sergeant Slaughter. Oh, do that again. You're gonna be doing some push -ups. Good. Yell at him more. The match we were promised last week, and the one that I've been anticipating for a week now, is up next. WWF World Heavyweight Champion Hulk Hogan returns to in-ring action to face Tiger Chung Lee. The champion comes out to Eye of the Tiger by the band Survivor. You know, the theme from the movie Rocky? Maybe that's where Hogan's been recently, training like Mr. Balboa, because I do have to give it to him. It does look quite impressive. Tiger Chung Lee tries to get an upper hand immediately as he attacks the champion with a kendo stick while the Hulkster is trying to get into the ring. I'd bring back up when my opponent was Hulk Hogan too. With the fact that the WWF World Heavyweight Championship is not on the line, Hulk Hogan does not have anything to worry about. So he takes his time, and when he does manage to finally get his hands on Tiger Chung Lee, the match remains firmly in the champion's control. Despite having a brief moment of promise, Chung Lee just does not have what it takes to run with the WWF's top dog, and he ends up losing to Hogan's atomic leg drop. Right after the match, Mean Gene Okerlund catches the winner for a quick interview. Okerlund claims to Hulk Hogan that the fans are 100% behind him, and the champion responds that it is equivalent to an instant love affair. As soon as I came here, it was an instant love affair, Daddy, between me and my people. Well, thank you. Gene then asks Hulk Hogan what it feels like to be the WWF World Heavyweight Champion, a question that is either ignored or not understood by the champion. I get it. Emotions can be hard sometimes. Instead, he states that he is not going to lose his championship to anybody. I hate that he might be right. The main event of WWF Championship Wrestling sees Tony Kalan get absolutely outclassed in every single way against his opponent, Jose Gonzalez. Kalan loses fast to a missile dropkick. With the end of WWF Championship Wrestling, it's time for us to head a little bit further down south to the National Wrestling Alliance's Worldwide Wrestling Program. Pistol Pez Wally and Brian Adidas start things off in tag team competition against Ali Bay and Kurt Von Hess in the first match tonight as the NWA television champion Tully Blanchard and David Crockett call commentary. The teamwork surprisingly between Bay and Von Hess outclasses their opponents. However, one moment of confusion is enough to seal the deal for them. Pistol Pez Wally manages to headbutt his opponent and secure the win for his team. Backstage, Bob Cottle and David Crockett have Paul Jones and the Assassins standing by for an interview. It seems that the war between the Boogie Woogie Man, Jimmy Valiant, and Jones' army is far from over, as that Boogie Woogie Maniac has set out a challenge. He wants Paul Jones, one-on-one, -on -one, in a steel cage. 
Paul Jones has been through a lot lately, and he is incensed at the fact that Jimmy Valiant just won't stop. What he thinks is happening is in the contract in his hand is a steel cage match for Jimmy Valiant, but one of the assassins, not realizing that it's his name on the paper. So he signs, and when he realizes his mistake as pointed out by David Crockett and Bob Cottle, he understandably has a meltdown. He's got you in a cage match. Me! Not him, but you. That's right. I didn't say anything about me! Then Cottle and Crockett practically turn the interview into a shakedown. With Paul Jones mentally unavailable, they demand that assassin number two unmask lest he face a suspension. What the hell is this? The mask has to come off the assassin that he beat right now. Or you're suspended. That's it. It has to come off. I suffered! Look, he already had to unmask at the Boogeyman Jam on March 17th. You don't have to keep humiliating the man. Still absolutely infuriated at the whole situation, Paul Jones then turns his anger on the now unmasked assassin number two, claiming that he never gave 100% in that match against the Boogie Woogie Maniac Jimmy Valiant. A scuffle then ensues. This man right here, just because you didn't give him 100% my week! Are you happy, David Crockett? You manipulated this whole situation so well to your own advantage that you're probably laughing to yourself backstage, aren't you, you smug little snake? Back in the ring, it's more tag team action. This time we get to see the pride of the Carolinas, Don Kernodal, as well as the NWA Mid-Atlantic Heavyweight Champion, the Russian Bear Ivan Koloff, who I will remind everybody is an honorary American citizen. They are accompanied by their manager, Gary Hart, as they set to face off against Gene Ligon and Vinny Valentino. Ligon is isolated early, and all Valentino can do is watch on from his corner and hope for the best. When Vinny does manage to get tagged into the match, he starts off strong against Koloff, but it's another story when it comes to Kernodal. Valentino then gets to experience exactly what his partner Ligon just went through as he gets himself isolated in enemy territory next. Mistakes cause losers. Ask Mark Youngblood. I absolutely love that nobody likes Mark Youngblood. Mr. Blanchard, you're doing a fantastic job on commentary, and please keep it up. I am eating up every word. A vicious clothesline from Kernodal sends Ligon to the afterlife, and while the referee is checking to make sure that Gene is actually still breathing, Crockett clears the air by announcing the fact that Dory Funk Jr. has been suspended due to the fact that he did not show up to a recent disciplinary hearing. I wonder what that's all about. Gene Ligon is thankfully confirmed to still be alive and tags in his partner Vinny Valentino, who then gets double teamed and put down following the cannon by Kernodal and Koloff. Backstage once again, David Crockett has Dirty Dick Slater available for an interview next. They immediately get into a spat when David states that Dick Slater is not the true NWA World Heavyweight Champion. I'm getting absolutely sick and tired of David Crockett pushing buttons on absolutely every single person and then also spreading the lie that Dick Slater is not the legitimate World Heavyweight Champion. Look pal, stick to the professional journalistic questions or leave the man alone. Where's Tully Blanchard? Not only that, can I make love better than you can, Ric Flair, but let me tell you something right now, I can wrestle, I am a machine. Not that myself or anyone else needed to know that. I would have assumed it was true by default. The nature boy is way too selfish to be a good lover. I mentioned recently that outside of his war with Paul Jones, the boogie woogie man Jimmy Valiant has also been taking pot shots at another person of interest, the exotic Adrian Street and his manager and wife, Miss Linda. We haven't seen much of Street in the Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling area, but he has made a name for himself in other NWA territories, and we get to see what he's all about here tonight as he takes on Keith Larson in one-on-one -on -one competition. Street demonstrates impressive wrestling ability and his appearance also plays a part in his success. It's clearly designed to be a psychological weapon and it's very effective against someone of Keith Larson's stature. It's so successful that Street secures a pinfall over Larson almost immediately following the initial bell. With the match over, 
Street and Miss Linda forcefully apply makeup to Keith Larson's face, and if you ask me, it's an upgrade. If this is what we can expect from Adrian Street and Miss Linda going forward, I think the Boogie Woogie Maniac might be barking up the wrong tree. Lies and rumors continue to spread backstage and somehow David Crockett is yet again involved as he interviews Rufus R. Freight Train Jones. Rufus continues to spread the lie that the big cat, Ernie Ladd, stole his $1,000. He didn't steal your money, you moron. You offered him the one grand to simply face you in the ring, something that he did, and you won. What's your problem? If you couldn't afford the $1,000, you shouldn't have put it up on the line. Pistol Pez Watley, who we saw at the beginning of World Wide Wrestling, comes out next at the request of Jones. He's here to help Rufus get his money back. Then, Jimmy Valiant is invited out upon Watley's request. Not paying attention to the $1,000 issue at all, the Boogie Woogie Maniac then tears into Paul Jones and states that he's incredibly ecstatic that he gets to face him in a steel cage match. Shut up! Paul Jones himself accompanies Assassin Number 1 next to the ring as the Assassin is set to face off against Sam Houston. Seems that Assassin Number 2's services have been terminated by Jones, which if you ask me is not good news, especially considering that he was usually the superior performer of the two Assassins. Despite this, a quick knee drop from Assassin Number 1 is enough to put Sam Houston away quickly for the 1-2-3. Once the match is over, Jones then proceeds to attack the loser, which for some reason entices King Kong Angelo Mosca Sr. to rush down to the ring in a rescue attempt. Mosca Sr. and Assassin Number 1, should I still call him Number 1 if Assassin Number 2 is no longer in the question? Regardless, they start going into each other, and it's only then that I notice the referee starts treating this like a scheduled match. What's going on here? Paul Jones tries to slip a metal plate for the assassin to use against King Kong, but he's caught by that big monkey. Another violent scuffle ensues between Mosca and the assassin, and now the referee just takes a step back and acts as if it's not a scheduled match. What the hell is going on here? Angela Mosca Jr. then comes to his father's aid, which prompts Paul Jones and the assassin to head back to the locker room. What a fiasco. You know, maybe Angelo Mosca Jr. didn't come down to his father's aid. Considering the fact that his match against Barry Orton was scheduled next anyways, he may have just been standing in the aisleway and went, ah, might as well help out anyways. When the match between Mosca Jr. and Orton begins, it's quite clear that they're both quite evenly matched. Angelo is just a little bit faster and more importantly, full of confidence. He is a former NWA Mid-Atlantic Heavyweight Champion after all. Mosca Jr. secures the win following a flying cross body. The Great Kabuki is in singles competition next and this time he's facing off against Bret Hart. Gary Hart stands ringside for support to the Great One, however little support is needed. The Great Kabuki focuses on Hart's head with several kicks before utilizing his dreaded claw. After another brief beatdown, the Great Kabuki employs his claw once again to Hart's head and puts him down for the 1-2-3. The main event of the week is another tag team match, this time between Jay and Mark Youngblood against Jeff Sword and Doug Vines. If it wasn't for Mark Youngblood, I wouldn't be the TV champion today. It's true. Thank you so much, Mark Youngblood, for sucking that bad that the NWA Television Championship could be immediately elevated no matter who took it from you, let alone the man of Tully Blanchard's caliber. As always, Jay Youngblood is the star of his team. He employs such a fantastic and unique repertoire. However, it's countered whenever Mark gets tagged in and the match just immediately starts to fall apart for the Youngbloods, or Mark retreats tagging his brother back in, saving the match just in the nick of time. Mark Youngblood military presses his brother Jay onto Doug Vines so that they can secure the victory as the main event comes to an end. One of the final words of the night comes from the NWA World Tag Team Champions, the Briscoe Brothers, Jack and Jerry. Briscoe stands for the best. Right now it does. 
the Briscoes announced that they will be taking the World Tag Team Championships down to their home state of Florida and competing there for the time being. They are absolutely sick and tired of the blatant corruption in the Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling area that they will not be returning until that they have been addressed. See? It really is a shame when you think that a tag team the caliber of the Briscoe Brothers would rather leave territories to ensure that their World Tag Team Championship reign is not consistently sabotaged by the people in charge. I wish the Briscoes all the best down in Florida. Lastly, David Crockett brings out exotic Adrian Street and his manager and wife, Miss Linda. All Street wants to know is one thing. There's one question I would like to ask you about these type of people. Could you tell me why these cowboys and rednecks walk so effeminately? It's all because they're just a bunch of scissors. I don't know about that, but then again, I'm not the one that is affected by Mr. Street's psychological warfare. There are probably a lot of people that just took offense to Street's comment that are in the backstage area of Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling, and it proves one thing already. Street's mind games are already at work. And that's the end of the week, folks. A lot happened. Big John Studd became $30,000 richer in the WWF, whereas in the NWA, Rufus R. Freight Train Jones vowed to get his $1,000 back from the big cat Ernie Ladd. Paul Jones faced and put down a mutiny in his ranks as he relieved assassin number two of his services before signing a contract to face the boogie woogie maniac Jimmy Valiant in a steel cage match. Meanwhile, Dory Funk Jr. was suspended from the NWA. And while we say goodbye to the NWA World Tag Team Champions, the Briscoe Brothers, as they head down south to Florida, we welcome another champion back. WWF World Heavyweight Champion Hulk Hogan returned to in-ring action, facing off against and beating Tiger Chung Lee. It proved that even though he had been absent from our TV screens for quite some time, Hulkamania is still running wild. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Tyler Vance Rants. Don't forget to hit the bell, like the video, and subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can also follow me on social media where I hope you'll share the video with your family and friends. Thanks for tuning in. I will see you next week. So long for now. Remineralized, more like crap. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Forgotten My Own Show's Name. <laughs> the champion comes out to Eye of the Tiger by the band Survivor. That rhymed. Right after the match, Mean Gene Oakland manages to catch the winner. The freight train states that the big cat, Ernie Ladd, stole his one. 100,000, that would be something. <laughs>